Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Chasing Freedom Podcast with Noah and Jeff. In this show, we're going to dive deep into flips, wholesales, holding rentals, and creatively structuring deals. So that we can show you how you can achieve that lifestyle of freedom that you desire. What's up, guys? Welcome back to the Chasing Freedom Show with Noah and Jeff. Today, I'm really excited. I've got my good buddy, um, I know we've, we've been getting a lot of guests from the Maui Mastermind, but you guys, these are heavy hitters, all doing awesome things in real estate. And so we think that they bring a ton of value to the show and their, and being able to share their experiences and everything like that. So today I've got Josiah Trowbridge and his company is Windows of Heaven and he does multifamily buys. You do single family buys as well, right? Yes, and you're sir. doing them in a couple different states. You're in Memphis, Texas. We're Ohio. At Ohio. One of your buddies behind me was distracting me. So I was like, I got all, <laughs> I can see him back there. He's checking out the show. Uh, yeah, dude, oh, I'm just funny. super excited to have you on, man. You're at, you're at 90 units now, which is insane. Like, and you still work a full-time job. <laughs> uh, they're a bunch of goobers yeah, back there. They're jealous. Sorry about that. No, you're totally um, fine. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Just, just crossed over, uh, just closed on a, a duplex yesterday. Um, just kind of pick them up where they make sense. Um, but yeah, at, at 90 at this point, you nailed it. Um, primarily invest in Memphis, um, some in Ohio, some in Texas, live in Denver, and um, really trying to, to put the framework in place to start doing more local flips. So for me here here in Denver, the Denver Metro, mm -hmm. um, and then some, some spec builds, got some irons in the fire for that as well. So I'm also a house hacker, still do it. And yeah. Um, you know, all, all the things, man. So it was seeing what you I guys it, got man. going on excites me. And I just love all the facets that you guys have. And I'm not going to lie. There's a lot about what's been going on in my head the last month. That is, uh, how can I do what Jeff and Noah are doing over up there in Boise? So, <laughs> um, it, it's fun. The grass fun. isn't always greener on the other side, man. I, I, <laughs> I, I hear that you've done 90 units all while working a full-time job and I could barely manage the 20 something, 27 units we have, and we're full-time in real estate. So <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm excited to uh, dig into your story. Um, if you don't mind, I'd love to hear your why, like, why did you get into real estate and why do you continue to push yourself through it? Cause I, I can't even imagine the amount of discipline you have to have with your time and your schedule being that you have the job, the full-time career. And then you also are managing your portfolio, including acquiring more rentals and then different states, which means different contacts. Like walk me through the why, and then let's, uh, let's eventually get to where you're at now. Yeah. The why, um, it's, it's so funny. I just love the name of your podcast, man, because that's a phrase that I've personally used. Uh, I say it, I've said it to my wife for years, chasing freedom, man. And, um, honestly, that's what I'm all about. I, I just don't like the system. I, I think that, uh, I, I often use a harsh phrase, but it's uh, tax cattle, man. That, that yeah. that's kind of this this idea behind put in forty years of your life and then hope that you have enough money that the stock market was good enough mm -hmm. to you that uh, when you're in your sixties and your body isn't as good as um, it used to be, that you hope to still have decent health to go do things. And I think that's silly. And so um, for me, it's it's really been the pursuit of of something different from that and, and more time with my family and, um, love to travel, love to spend time with my family, love to play golf, love to go to, uh, the beach, love to do a lot of things that isn't work. And yeah. so, um, that's, that's what drives me. It really does. And so that's my why, um, to answer that question. Yeah. Um, I like that. You know what it reminds yeah. me of is, um, I, f I feel like actually Brandon Turner said this when we were all with them. I think he said that, you know, it's like planning. It's the difference of planning to uh, live to work or planning to work to live. And it's like, right. which one are you, which path are you on? And I'm, I'm with you, man. Like, I think sometimes, especially as men, we get so wrapped up in this idea of like our career has to be our life. And for some people that, that they don't have that choice, your career is your life. But I'm with you. Yeah. I would rather have my family be my life. And then like my work just supports my lifestyle. Not Absolutely. my, not, you know what I mean? Like, I don't want, uh, I don't, I, I don't want it the other way around. I want to plan my work around the way we, we want to live. That's why we're out here chasing freedom and doing real estate because we want that choice. We don't want that choice Amen. to be made for us. 
So hundred percent, man, you, you know, since, since Maui, uh, being together out there, following each other on social media, you, you shared about your, what financial freedom looks like for you. And it's powerful, man, because I think people believe that they need to make millions and millions of dollars in order to change their life and have a different environment, um, more free time. And the reality is, and your story is very similar to mine. It's, it's funny, kind of those numbers. Um, but but there's a lot of freedom that comes from um, just a you know several thousand dollars a month that can come in passive income yeah. and uh, allows us to do a lot of things and and live a very different life that's not bound by the nine to five and um, it's it's exciting man and so um, I, I'm grateful for real estate for that reason and you asked me kind of how I got started I, I was I'm fortunate man I was born into a, a really great home with wonderful parents and. Um, they always, they always encourage really hard work. They have work ethic, like nobody I know. Um, but couple that with an entrepreneurial spirit that they both harbored. They were always running different businesses Mm -hmm. and doing different things. And they even gotten involved. They had even gotten involved in some real estate things for a time. But, uh, when I was, I want to say I was in junior high, my dad encouraged me to read rich dad, poor dad. And, um, I couldn't put it down. And and from that point in time, man, like so many other people's story, I knew that real estate is what I wanted to do. Um, so you, so actually, thir- you started young. So junior well, high, you're like, man, I want to do real estate. <laughs> well, at least I knew that about it for sure. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of the, the, the thing is I, I made my first real estate investment purchase in 2014 here in Denver. Okay. And, um, the, the Denver market is expensive. Um, so that purchase, kind of a fun story. I've, I've been excited about the opportunity to share sort of the creative way that I, that I financed that deal because I've, I've, I've listened to dang near every Bigger Pockets podcast, a lot of other real estate podcasts, and I've yet to encounter someone that um, has said that they did things the way that I did it. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of, kind of fun to share that. So, uh, Anyway, 2014, I was married a few years, had always been telling my wife um, that this was what I wanted to do. So she knew that she was prepared. We, we were married, I guess, six and a half, or I'm sorry, five and a half years before finally pulling the trigger on the first purchase. Um, kind of an easy one, a little bit of a softball. It was my grandmother's townhouse and she was moving out. And um, so I had an in, um, there's no, there's no sugar coat in it. It was, a, it was a blessing. Yeah. But also you were, you um, were prepared to take advantage of the opportunity. So I, I wouldn't downplay it by any means. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it um, yeah, it, it was still scary for me Terrifying. at the time yeah. and, <laughs> and committing to it. And so uh, one of the things in some of these higher price markets is you just are intimidated by how am I going to come up, you know, 25% of something that's a lot of money can be still a significant amount of money. So um, I had this idea that uh, essentially that I implemented was I started chatting with my sister who was very much in rental mode, um, just apartment living and renting. And uh, I went to her and I said, hey, what if you co-sign on this loan with me and um, I'll bring the down payment of this, this house, you co-sign on the loan, which makes you an owner occupant which then qualified the purchase for just the minimum three and a half percent down payment. Mm -hmm. So that went from, I need tens of thousands of dollars to under $10,000 for this deal. And um, that was really friendly on the, on the pocketbook for me. My sister, the deal was I had, I I had her sign a contract and we said, Hey, um, I own the property for all intents and purposes. I'll, I'll pay for repairs. I'll pay for renovations. I'll, I'll renovate this property, pay for all of it. Um, I'll bring the down payment. You rent it for only what I'm paying on the mortgage, which for the time, this was 2014, that was dang near 50% of what she would have paid in rent for the same place. So the deal for her was dang, I would say is yeah, as good deal as for it her. was for me to, to pay half of what she would have otherwise been paying yeah. for the place. And, and for me, it was, Hey, I, I want the appreciation, the equity and, and that you just acknowledge in, in, in writing that this is mine. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, it worked out. Um, 
a couple years later, she, she wanted more space. And I said, let's go do it again. And that's when I bought my first actual single family detached home um, by the same method. And then I rented out the, the townhouse. And so um, pretty, pretty neat, man. I, I think it was pretty sad. That's very unique. Yeah. You know what and, I love um, about that, that I want to pull out if you, if you don't mind is um, I think that, that the problem that a lot of people just trying to get into it or trying to do their first deal make is uh, one, they think that they deserve the entire piece of the pie, right? So there, there, there's a little bit of greed that comes in. Um, so for example, like with you, with your sister, you created a win-win, very symbiotic relationship. It wasn't a parasitic relationship. You didn't say, hey, sister, you're going to help me out and do this. And then in exchange, you're also going to pay full market rent so I can cash flow. You said, no, I appreciate you being willing to help me in exchange of value you're going to get something that is far below market rent. So you're going to save a couple hundred dollars a month. She had no intention. She didn't want to buy, right? That's obviously why she was willing to do this with you. So it was right. like, it was a total win-win instead of Josiah wins and his sister loses or the other way around. And yeah. I, I think that in the beginning, it's important to remember um, one of the formulas for success that I was taught very early on was uh, like relationship capital plus intellectual capital equals financial capital. So relationship, you took good care of your sister, uh, intellectual capital, you studied and you understood how real estate worked, at least at some fundamental uh, level to get started. And then in exchange, you created uh, financial capital, right? Because I'm sure that your townhome appreciated and then eventually you started cash flowing on it. Absolutely. That's exactly right, man. And, and here in Denver, it was, you know, there, there's always a little bit of uncertainty about all of this stuff right. and that, that, that changes with time for me, I'm sure with you, as we just see the uh -huh. power of real estate and how it works. But, um, there was no guarantees that it was going to appreciate, but I was pretty sure it would. And, uh, for me, you know, the idea has always been, and I've said this to my wife a million times, so she probably rolls her eyes at it, but if you can just get a property in your name and, and if you can have a tenant helping you pay that mortgage, even if it's not creating cash flow and changing your life today, the the power that that will have on your retirement, um, you know, down the road is is incredible because somebody's that mortgage is getting paid, that property is being purchased, mm -hmm. and not by you. And so, so early on, to be honest with you, that was really the only thing I had in mind um, because I wasn't thinking big enough, admittedly. But um, really, it was just to bolster that that retirement when I'm age. 65. Yep. And, and, and in Denver, it's so expensive here. I didn't really see how um, this has changed, but at the time I didn't see how I was going to scale um, very much because um, of how cost prohibitive things were. So, right. so originally the idea was, Hey, I'd like to have like 10 properties here in Colorado so that when I'm 65, hopefully most of them are paying for and I can have my retirement largely um, be paid for by the rents coming from these properties that are owned. And um, didn't take too long for me to realize that uh, I wanted a lot more than that. I didn't want to wait till I was 65 no. to, to retire. So um, thus began sort of the next, the next phase. And I don't know if you had any. Yeah, no, let's go into it. Yeah. So uh, you got your townhome, then you got a single family, and then you probably realized that this was going to take longer to scale in Colorado because of the purchase price. So then you, what happened next? Yeah, that's exactly right. So I'm just going, you know, somehow, some way there's people out there who, who are just like me, don't come from any money, who have bootstrapped their way into uh, building a real estate empire. Mm -hmm. um, this was before I ever got acquainted with bigger pockets, but I, I just started going, I'm going to figure out how to be one of those people. And, and I just made up my mind. I said, I'm, I, I want to, I want to build a real estate portfolio that will free, free me from the nine to five. And, and so that became the driver for me. And, and for me on my modest income, I do have a full-time job or, mm -hmm. and, and did at the time, but um, it's a slow build, especially when you're talking about the median home prices being multiple hundreds of thousands right? of dollars. Um, challenging. So um, I, I, I was at a baseball game here in Colorado, Colorado Rockies game with, with a friend and he happened to invite another friend, asked me if he could drag another guy along. And, um, he happened to be a guy that 
had shifted his, his focus over to Memphis. I didn't even know he was in real estate, but um, he started encouraging me with um, looking into Memphis because it was a really strong cash flow market. And for me, cash flow became really the name of the game. That had been what I, what I realized. It's all about what kind of monthly income can I generate mm-hmm. to replace my day job income and, and live a different life? And so cash flow became the goal. Colorado is great for appreciating. Um, but uh, I heard this and man, that just set a fire in me. And I think I booked a flight just maybe a day or two later. Um, told my wife I was going to go figure out Memphis and um, flew out there and lined up relation, uh, meetings with property management companies and realtors and um I knew that if I was going to invest out of state, I needed to have a solid relationship with a management company. So that became my focus. Um, I met with a bunch and, and settled on one that today still proves me right. Um, and, and just have an awesome relationship with that team. And, and I tell you that if you're thinking about investing out of state, property management is is everything. I mean, that it's not everything, but it's it's, it's dang near piece. close. We've learned this the hard way. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. We've learned this the hard way. It's the biggest piece. And so really do your due diligence there. Um, and I feel that I did that. I interviewed a bunch and settled on the one that I felt was the best and, um, they've helped me a lot. Do you want to, do you want to spend maybe like a minute to two minutes talking about some of the due diligence pieces that helped you to identify a good property manager versus a bad property manager? Yeah. Yeah. That sounds good. I, um, I think that I would start with, I'm a very relational person. Mm-hmm. Um, it's maybe one of the, the traits that God gave me that I feel I is a strength, um, just connecting with people, um, always leading with kindness and just trying to, to build and develop strong relationships, friendships mm-hmm. that then become, it's harder to, for somebody to want to take advantage yeah. of you or hurt you if, if you're friends with them. And so, um, I, I looked for that personally with the people that I was talking to and interviewing and, and the group that I settled on, I just can't say enough about them and um, how I felt like that was reciprocated, that their core values were just integrity mm-hmm. and, um, and really being just honest and, and wanting to take care of their clients. And so um, that was one of the biggest due diligence pieces for me, I would say. Um, they obviously had they had some, some, they had a decent amount of properties that they were managing, which said something to me. And, um, just meeting with them, they, they seemed to have the pieces in place. They offered, um, the ability to have rehabs happen in house. So they had a lot of contract wow. relationships. Um, That's that very was cool. huge. Yeah. I encourage that. I encourage you to look for that. You got to be in a big enough market, I think for, for some of those management companies to have that ability. Um, but these guys did. Uh, so that was a piece, um, somebody dedicated to the books and accounting. They had that, that was another, that was another element to what I was looking for. And, um, and then the owners were just go-getters and, and they have ambition to, to grow and scale. And so I told them I had that same ambition and, and, uh, that that was going to work well together. Cause that was going to mean that they would want to take care of me. So that as, as I added that they were going to want to keep keep, keep working with me. So, um, I hope that's sufficient, but I would tell you that that's kind of the, the, the criteria I looked for, um, right. bookkeeping contractor relationships, um, a desire to grow and then just that kindness and, and relation relationship element that, uh, they exhibited. Yeah. That, no, I think those I are great. I think those are great metrics. Um, we were drawn to our property management company in, uh, South Bend originally for the same reasons. Um, one, the relationship felt very natural and personal, uh, to the, uh, you know, ability to go in and make repairs and the connections to be able to do that. I think that's something that, um, is probably under, how would you say this under looked, uh, frequently for people looking to go invest out of state. It's right. not, it's not your, it's like, it's not your, um, for example, like you, for your own personal market where you own a couple of those properties in Denver, you probably know streets, you know, parks, you know, schools, you know, the school ratings, you know, the good areas and the bad areas without having to do any research. When you're not from the area. You don't know any of that. 
Right. Like we uh, dodged a huge bullet in South Bend. Uh, somebody sent us a package of like 17 single family homes and duplexes all mixed in for $342,000. I was like, it's the deal of a lifetime. It's a freaking steal. <laughs> We're going to make a home run hit on this. Um, because we, we, like we understood the value of the properties we had already bought in, which the average like single family home was worth like 80 grand. And like right. a duplex would be like a hundred and then like a fourplex would be like 125 to 150 depending on condition. So we're like, holy crap, we're getting a steal. Right. Then we went into, we actually flew into South Bend cause we were checking up on our stuff already. And we're like, might as well go check out the portfolio. It was in a war zone. Literally looked like <laughs> if you've ever played like Call of Duty and I don't play a lot of video games, but literally looked like, like when you go like in Call of Duty and you go like shoot, you know, play multiplayer games, or whatever. And you're in like torn yep. down houses. That's what it looked like. I was like, I wouldn't buy you, you, you couldn't actually give me money to take these properties. So, uh, yeah, having yeah. somebody that has the relationships, knows the area is hungry and ready to grow. I think that's important. Um, appreciate you sharing oh, huge. that. That'll help a lot of people. So, yeah, well, and just piggyback on what you're saying, that's, that's a huge piece that I did not say, and you, you couldn't be more right. I mean, they, they're local born and raised, grew up in the area and just a wealth of knowledge about the city that they, that they, that they live in and yep. operate in and um, super valuable. I, I leaned on them heavily for advice on various acquisitions. Yeah. Just, hey, is this, is this worth buying? Is this area solid? And, and if you can get that from your management company, that's just, it's a big deal. It's huge. It's really helpful. Yeah. And the accounting side mm -hmm. is really big because um, I think that's probably one of our biggest lagging pieces right now is like, if you don't know your metrics, how do you know how to be better? How do you know if you have an underperforming asset? How do you know if you're hitting market rents? You don't until you have the accounting piece in place. So yeah, um, garbage helpful. in, garbage out, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I appreciate you yeah. sharing this. So tell us, tell us how you got to where you're at now. So, I mean, we, we understood you started looking in other States. What were some of the first things you picked up? What, what type of properties? Yeah. So, um, single family homes was, was the start out there. Um, went from, I guess it's, it's important to, to say the revelation of what a, I'll call, I'll call for instance, Memphis, what at the time, anyway, I'll call it a cash flowing market where how I would define Denver, um, is an appreciating market where you, you might even in Denver have a hard time having a property that you buy cover your mortgage cost, assuming you have a mortgage yeah, on it. Yeah. Um, even though our rents are super high, the cost of the property is also super high. So they're not typically, they're not typically super high cash flowing deals. So I, I made this mental shift saying, you know, the appreciation game was for that idea that I'll, I'll bolster was no, this is what I need now to change my life now. Mm -hmm. And so when I made that change and it was, Hey, I'm even going to be willing to part with what I have here in Denver, which at the time was three properties. Um, so I got my wife on board with this, just shared kind of where my head was at and what I was doing and, um, went ahead and listed one of my, the first, that townhome actually is the first thing I listed. And, um, super blessed, just crushed that as far as from what I paid for it in 2014. I sold it in the fall of 2018. So four years later, um, I think I, I turned about a hundred dollars in, in profit off of that. And I did my first ever 1031 exchange. I had all those pro proceeds go into an escrow fund and I didn't even know where they were going to go. So I went on a trip to Memphis and said, you know, change happened. And so I, I flew out there on a trip, just house shopping, literally looking for, there was, you know, with the 1031 exchange, there's a little bit of a, well, there's a deadline on mm -hmm. it. So, so you're kind of forced a little bit, which is beautiful in some ways, because it's just kind of a fire under you. That's Makes just going, you take action. Yeah. Yeah. Forces that action. So, um, so that's what I did. I went out there and I, I went under contract, found three different properties that I liked. Um, they satisfied the 1031 exchange and, and thus began um, out of state uh, investing for me. And those three properties I, I still have today. That was three years ago, fall of fall of 2018 was when I made this shift and started taking this thing more seriously and saying, hey, I want to start doing this. And, and so um, your question was, what am I buying out there? How am I doing it? Um, I took I took equity from what I had in that 
that first deal here and, and bought those there. And then I've been burring and, um, between the burr method and, um, a HELOC on my personal residence, my wife and my, I, um, we bought our first home in Denver back in 2010, which was shortly after the, the great recession and everything else. And so you can imagine, um, yeah. super blessed, super blessed. Um, our home appreciated like crazy and that enabled us to have a really significant HELOC. Uh, for those who don't know, home equity line of credit, um, pretty neat thing. When you have one of those, you really are only charged by the bank what portion of the money that you're using at mm -hmm. the time. So you kind of get to become your own bank. And so um, it was a combination of getting started in Memphis with the sale of that first investment property of mine and then leveraging my HELOC um, on my own home to start buying. And so it's it's just been a process of, of, of trying to max out the Burr method. And, mm -hmm. and I know that your listeners are probably familiar with that, but um, doing that by rehab, rent it, refinance and repeat, man. And um, it's been fun. It's been fun. But, but, uh, but I guess hit me with another question. Yeah. Or I like that, man. I yeah. I'm, I'm going to start rambling. <laughs> well, why don't you take <laughs> us through, take us through um, your most recent deal. So I think you said you just bought a duplex. Is that right? Just bought a duplex. Yeah. Take yeah. us through that. Like, wh where's it at? What were the numbers? Uh, how much cash out of your own pocket did you have to put in? Um, and what's the what's the end goal with this property? Perfect. So yeah, I'll try to make that one quick. Um, closed on it. Got a good deal. Um, one of the relationships out in Memphis that I've made over the years brought it to me and said, "Hey, you know, I think that you should consider this one." Didn't take, but you know. 15 minutes of just kind of analyzing and going, yep, absolutely. I want to figure this one out. And so, um, what I, I ended up actually buying it for $50,000, five zero. Um, wow. it's a, it's a duplex it almost, one side. It would almost Go scare ahead. me a little bit because I'm like, now I know that sometimes low prices aren't a good thing because I'm like <laughs> low prices sometimes mean you're in like the ghetto or a war right. zone. So, yep. uh, okay. So uh, who brought you this? One of your agents? Out there? One, one of my agents, yeah. O off market um, or right. on market? Uh, this one, this was a, a relationship that he had with the seller, but they they asked him to list it for him. Oh, and, okay. And he and I have a good enough relationship that he typically calls me first, which I'm really blessed. He he's a rock star out there. Um, but uh, so yeah, it, it technically was a an MLS deal, but uh, one that I had first crack on and an advocate in my corner who was the listing agent basically by my side to, That's helpful. to help make it happen. Yeah. Um, and then I, I want to kind of speak to what you said. It is totally true. One of the only reasons why this home is uh, $50,000 is because the, the zip code is not a great zip code, but, but Memphis is an environment where um, it's my management company out in Memphis that gave me this phrase, but they said Memphis is like a checkerboard. You can have, um, a really great area right next to a, a really terrible area right next to a really great area. And it's just crazy. So you really have to know it really well. And um, the zip code is not an ideal zip code, but the street itself, it's on a, a, a clean street. You look at the gutters, there's no trash in the gutters. Um, there's, there's two churches that sit really close by and um, everything just looks clean and well kept. Mm -hmm. And so um it, it's crazy how that can be the difference of just going, if, if there was trouble, you'd kind of see evidence of it. And right. So I feel good about this one. And it's, we're inheriting a tenant on the, the one side. It's, it's a $550 um, rent from the one tenant and the other side is vacant, which gives us a chance to, to put a little bit of uh, work into that side and make it a little nicer. A little spit and, shine. Um, <laughs> exactly. And then, and then hopefully get the rents at market where they, where they should be for that. So what would be market um, rents for that duplex? So the current, the, the tenant we inherited, like I mentioned is five fifty, And I think the other side, once we're, once we're able to um, put in new flooring, new paint, and clean it up, I yeah. bet we'll, we'll see six to six fifty. So another hundred bucks maybe over what we're getting on the, the existing side. So when you combine that, we're talking about, um, you know, potentially twelve to thirteen hundred dollars in gross rent. Yeah. Um, what do you think total rehab is going to be? 
On that side, that's what I'm excited about this property. I think it's a home run, man, because I, I really think that we'll pay, I don't know, $12,000 renovating wow. the right side is all just new flooring, new paint. It's a small duplex. Yeah. So there's not a lot of square footage to touch and, um, and then put in some new appliances and some, some new countertops and paint the cabinets and Bob's your uncle, man. So, man, I like this. And so th- what's interesting about this is, um, so often we hear that like the 1% rule is not like a thing anymore. And this is oh, the, what this deal that you have right now is quite a ways over the 1% rule. It's actually closer ways. to, uh, it's closer. It, it, is it even over two? Yeah. It's actually it's closer. Over, yeah. Yeah. It's a little it, over two. A little fully over, stabilized. Yeah. yeah. Gross. Yeah. Yep. So yeah, almost. Yeah, you're right. It is. And, and so, yeah, when he sent it my way, that's why I say it was a, took me very little time to go. Yep. Sign me up. So, and these don't come that way. It's slowed down. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't find these all the time, but um, it's a blessing when you can, they're still out there. They're still, they out are. There. they're definitely out there. So, they're out there for the yeah. people that are looking and constantly taking action. Right. I think that's the difference is especially for someone listening and being like, well, I can't find no deals like that. Well, like my first question to you would be like, how often are you looking? Yep. How many people are you calling? How many agents did you talk to? And that's actually, okay. So that's actually what I want to go into next with you. How did you start this relationship with this agent? I, I think where most people go wrong with these types of relationships they're trying to start is it's, it's like one-sided. So like one person's just trying to take and how, like, how did you give value to the agent where he now treats you as a loyal customer and wants to bring you deals first? Right. Um, I'll, I'll lead again with, with just that, that relationship, he, he's a good guy and, and just phone call conversations are, you just try to get to know somebody and, and build a friendship that that's, I can't overstate how important that's been for me. Mm-hmm. It may not be for everybody, but it's huge. I mean, I, I just, I want to know how he's doing and, and genuinely learn to care about somebody and, and all that. So that's a big piece. Um, I, I focused on building a relationship with this guy because he's one of the few real estate agents out there that is is really um, investor minded mm-hmm. and focused. Most most listing agents are concerned with buying and selling to to home owner occupants, and and that's a whole different world. And so, this guy adds a lot of value to me by by understanding how investors think, how mm-hmm. I think, what we're looking for, and then taking the time to research further and. He he does that. He he spends a lot of time researching and, and acquiring the mind of an investor and putting in the effort to do it. So developing the the strong relationship with him was I know in 2019 he told me that I, I bought more properties from him than any of his other clients. So, you know, that puts me on a just by naturally something where, okay, I'm I'm technically his best client. Yeah. So that goes a long way. And then um, I know it's been said a million times, Brandon Turner talks about it all the time or has over the years with the podcast there and bigger pockets, but um, just making good on what you say you're going to do. Because if I, if I jerked him around and, you know, went under contract on something, but didn't buy it or did that at once, maybe he'd overlook that. But if you start doing that sort of thing a bunch it's hard, hard for probably somebody on his yeah. end to, to be excited about things. So, yeah, your repetition so I think that, matters a lot. Yeah. Repetition and just being true to your word and mm-hmm. making sure that you got your ducks in a row yep. and that you're going to make good on it. So um, one of the big things I wanted to talk about kind of transitioned into was, was for me just thinking about how real estate has changed your life. It's changed mine. And um, for, for other people listening, um, we, we, you know, I, I said about that first property that I bought, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't sure, you know, you, there's ne- there's never any guarantees when never. you're investing, yep. but as time goes on, the thing that I, real estate gives me more confidence than any other investment out there. And, um, sure enough, that first property that I bought went just the market just continued to ascend upward yeah. and I was able to, to do a lot of damage with the equity out of that. And so, um, one of the properties that kind of on y'all's y'all's boxes to check to be prepared to have this talk with you today was just what was a property that you wanted to kind of hone in on. And um, the one that I'd really like to share about 
nothing overtly special about it other than the timing of when I bought it. It was, it was a property that was sent to me in a very similar fashion as the one I just closed mm-hmm. on the other day where, um, the same guy, same real estate agent that I have a good relationship with back in March of 2020, which if, if that has a rings a bell, it's when sure does. Yeah. All, all kinds of hell was breaking loose. The world was on fire. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have a lot of strong opinions about all of that, but I'll spare you that in the podcast, but it was kind of a scary time, but, but this, this deal was presented to me before any of that started taking place here, here in the States. And, um, it sounded good, just a single family home in a really great area, mm-hmm. really great neighborhood. And I believed that it was a really good purchase. Um, didn't need much work. And, um, the asking price was $75,000. There were a bunch of different people interested and I just went ahead and offered asking. And uh, sure enough, I got it and I'm under contract on it when all of all of the country starts shutting down. And um, in that time, it was, it was a significant amount of money for me to be committed to. And it just was, I think I'm, I'm not alone that it was very uncertain for me. And, um, I was nervous. I was nervous about it. And, um, I just had this really stressful couple of weeks where every day went by, I'm closer to when I got to pony up the cash and make this purchase. And, and there was a lot of wavering about whether or not I should back out and just sit on that cash. Right. And like be safe and feel, feel better about the situation by having money not tied up in that house, but that could maybe float me and my family if, if if the whole world goes to, to you know what? (laughs) So it made me nervous, but, um, I just knew that it was a good purchase and, um, I I stuck with it and and made the buy. And the, the fun thing about that, as far as burr conversations go, is that bought it for $75,000 right at the front end of the, the, COVID stuff unfolding and all of the people not working and everything else that came with it. And um, just seven months later, fast forward, I I had seasoned it. It had been more than six months since I bought it. I was able to, to go ahead and do a refinance to put a loan on it per the Burr method. Mm-hmm. And the property appraised for $115,000. Uh, Gosh. Seven and you didn't really put later, much into rehab, right? I, I put nothing into rehab on this on this particular property, and um, got a loan. The bank approved, you know, seventy five percent of of the appraised value. And um, not only did I get all of my seventy five thousand dollars back, but I also got an additional ten thousand in in just capital to go do other things with. So um, I, I I think the moral of the story, why I wanted to share that, is just the power of real estate mm-hmm. because. Um, just to encourage people that, um, people need homes and and this is a clean, nice house that I have a good tenant in who pays on time. And, um, he's told my management company, he loves the house and he loves living there. And there's just an environment where people need a place to live and that's not going to change. Real estate provides, provides these kinds of opportunities. And so kind of push through the fear and, um, was blessed on the other side of it, uh, to have something that house that was um, last fall that I finally did that loan. And today I think it's worth $140,000. Yeah, right. So I, I, I love that you shared that story. Um, I, I think that, that we all face fear going into real estate, right? Like there's, there's, and I also think too, it doesn't change. Like I would say like, I have a whole lot less fear buying like single family home flips. Like today I've got an, one of our team members going to walk a property. I probably won't ever set fit in, foot in it and we're going to waive all of our contingencies. Now, would I have ever done that on my first like 10 deals? No, never. But I'm at the point now where I'm like, within reason, there's only so many things that can go wrong at a property and I can fix them, right? Like we can, we can make it right. So, um, but facing the fear is like the fundamental foundation to becoming successful in anything. If you run right. away from it, like you, if you would have ran away from this deal, you would have missed out on this opportunity, this story, this experience, being able to give this person a great home to live in. Um, you would have missed out on all of that had you let fear dictate your decision. Right. So I, I think it's important to sometimes like try to remove the emotion and say, okay, look, hey, I know that there's a lot of stuff going on, but I need to take advantage of this opportunity. 
And then also too, like looking at the worst case scenario. Okay, what's the worst that could have happened? Could have mm-hmm. not appraised. You would have had to leave your money in the deal, but you probably still would have cash flowed because your family right. have lived off the cash flow. Probably would you have had to cut yep. some expenses? I mean, maybe no more Starbucks for you know a little while. But other than <laughs> right. that, you probably find a way to make it work. Um, yeah, that time of uh, that time of uh, was scary. Uh, you're cool. absolutely right, and and that conversation in the in the walls of my home with my wife about making following through on the deal was. I, I vividly remember saying this to her. I said, you know, if if truly all of this stuff really goes just crazy, I mean, I was I had crazy thoughts that shouldn't have been in my head about like, uh-huh. entering into the next great depression at that yeah. time, you know, and what's yeah. going to happen with all of this and all kinds of thoughts. And, and I remember saying to my wife, you know, with this particular purchase, even if everything else goes south, we can sell what we have here in Denver and go live in this house. In yes. Texas if that's yeah. what we have to do, you, you know, totally so, could. And that was and it. Those were the conversations I had with myself as well as with my wife, but, um, about just going like, no, we're going to do this. Mm-hmm. And, um, and man, what a cool thing. It, it's, it's probably my favorite, my favorite real estate experience to this point of just knowing how dang near crippled I was, um, at the time, but just saying no, like pushing through that and, and, and what a blessing, um, it is to have done so. <laughs> fear, so. fear is a powerful, um, guide. How would you say that? Fear is a powerful guide guiding you down the wrong path, right? There are some, some fear is good. Some fear will keep you, uh, safe and help you make healthy decisions. Um, I had bought in a property at the same time, same time, uh, as you during March of 2020, and I remember like walking up and down the street of that property and being like, I'm the dumbest person on this whole block. <laughs> like there's literally no one that has paid this much for a property. Um, but I knew it was still a deal, right? I ended up buying it. Same thing. I faced my fear with the full intention that I was going to lose every single dollar I put into this property. Um, and then now today that property has like $175,000 of equity in it. Um, so it's, it, it's interesting, right? And it, I'm not going to say that it always turns out like that. I'm sure that there are people yeah. that were caught in the other end of it. Um, but I think just pl- like planning, having contingencies, having backup plans, having multiple exits is, is, is the, the way to go about it, but we have to face our fears at the end of the day. Yeah. So, absolutely. um, well, cool. Hey, so let's, uh, to wrap up the end of the show, what I'd like to have you share is, um, maybe any type of advice you've ever gotten in, in, inside of real estate or business or whatever that, that has tremendously helped you and then any books you recommend and any podcasts you recommend. Okay. Advice in real estate. Um, I think it's, it's Mark Ferguson. Who's a, who's a Colorado guy like myself, who's far more successful than I am. Um, but I follow him on uh, social media. And, uh, one of the things I remember him posting was just the simple thing that said appreciation happens. And, um, and, and so that's what's so cool about, about real estate is it pays you in so many different ways and you can make a case for um, buying a property that doesn't even cash flow you a penny. If you can just cover the expenses and have somebody help pay down a mortgage on it, how much further ahead you're going to be than somebody that's just doing what droves of other people are doing by praying and hoping that their 401k is going to somehow multiply to the extent to, to, to make their life comfortable for them in retirement. Um, so anyway, that I always keep that in the forefront of my mind because I've, I've seen it, I've experienced it. Some of these stories I shared about my experience have approved that appreciation and housing happens. It's, it's really neat. Um, good advice, you know, um, well, I'll tell you what, you challenged me when we were in, uh, Hawaii, uh, I guess what was closer to two months ago now, but, um, I'm trying to, I'm trying to get my ducks in a row and just figure out how to, how to pull a Noah and, uh, <laughs> and really go all in. And, um, and so that's, that's, that's what I'm working at right now. And, um, I, I believe that there's power in, in that and, and just, you don't have any choice, but to, to succeed when you, when you go in all in on something and, um, I've been blessed. I've got a family at my day job that I, these guys that I work with, the knucklehead that was in the yeah. window back there is, is one of those guys that, uh, I get to work with in my day job. But, 
um, he went all in on this business and he's, he's, he's been very successful as a result. And I see what you're doing. So, um, just committing, man, being passionate and, and committing and don't quit. I've taken my lumps. We didn't get into some of those. Um, but I, I have some, some, what you could call horror stories that I've survived and man, the lessons I've learned from it are, are invaluable. And I know it's cliche to say, but I wouldn't change it. Like yeah. I, I, I wouldn't change it. I learned so much from the things that went wrong that, uh, I'm blessed. So, so not giving up, going all in committing, um, books that I've read, man, I love Brandon Turner's books. I just love the way that he presents stuff. It makes it um, simple. He does. I've read all of his, um, but rich dad, poor dad. That's, that's, that's a good one. My, that's my end all be all man. That's what changed and made me think the way that I think. And yeah. he did that through that book. So I like that. Um, yeah. So I'm enjoying your podcast, dude. I, I love Thank what you. You, know, you and Jeff got going on and, um, been listening to that fun here in Heather the other day. And, um, yeah. You know, one thing I wanted to share based off what you just said, um, and it, we don't, we don't get super, uh, spiritual or religious very often, but, um, I think that there's also an aspect to, we are given certain gifts in life, whether you want to believe that that's from a universe or a God or whatever it may be. Um, I think we owe it to the world, to the other people who aspire to be like us or to our families um, to maximize those gifts, right? So like you're talking about, you know, um, you know, what are the next steps for you and how far are you going to take this real estate career and going all in? Uh, I just want to say like, I think that you owe it to everybody around yourself to do it. Yeah. Well, that's awesome, man. So, uh, of, of all the, the amazing conversations I had in Hawaii, uh, it was the last night of our mastermind at, around a campfire mm-hmm. night that you, that you said, Almost that to me at that point in time. And, uh, I kind of hate you for it, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, now you have the it's pressure not going away, man. And, uh, it, it's driving me and I'm excited because that's, that's the plan. So, uh, well, I'm excited, man. We're going to have, I think you and I will have a lot more opportunities to dive deeper into that. And, uh, I, I'm excited to be a part of that journey with you. Uh, I think we're going to do like a weekly or biweekly meetup, me and you and a couple other guys, right. Yeah. And talk about real yeah. estate and I'll push each other. So that'll be really fun, man. I'm looking forward to it. You're a genuinely good guy. I'm excited for my guests to hear this show because, uh, everything you share is, is, is very real. You're also a little too humble. So like, dude, you've built a massive portfolio. You've done an awesome job in real estate. You've done it all with limited time and while growing and raising your family. And so like, if you guys are listening, like Josiah's advice is tangible stuff that you can take and go apply to your real estate. You, you're either your real estate business if you have it or to go build a real estate business if you don't. And uh, yeah, I just appreciate everything you've shared, man. I appreciate you opening up and being vulnerable and talking about things and where you want to go. Um, how do the guests get a hold of you? Because I'm, I'm, I'm sure that people are going to want to reach out and I encourage them too because you're, you're such a nice dude. I know you're going to take the time to help. Yeah, well, awesome, man. Yeah, that um, just helping, just to speak to that briefly, that's something um, – that, that I, that I'm passionate about. That's kind of what this thing is really becoming about. It's Mm -hmm. it's meeting with people that hear what I'm doing and see what I'm doing. And, and I'm being diligent to take the time when asked to sit down and share. And so that's a passion of mine. So I welcome people to reach out to me. Um, I, I, I am no rock star. Um, I'm just committed. I'm just, I'm not going to quit. That's all I'll tell you. But Instagram, I'm on Instagram. It's, uh, my name just well sorry it's just my initials jd followed by my last name trowbridge so jd trowbridge that's my instagram handle and then uh welcome people email me man at um that's my first initial j followed by my last name trowbridge and that's at windows of heaven re.com okay cool man so, windows of heaven re for real estate.com um j trowbridge that's that's the front of it and yeah, feel free to reach out. If I if I uh, hear from you, I'll, I'll respond for awesome. sure. Awesome. So, well, guys, if you're listening, I, I definitely encourage you to uh, get over the fear of, of talking to, you know, um, high-level players in this game. Call them up. They're willing to talk. They're willing to help. Josiah is definitely one of those guys. Don't miss your opportunity if you've listened to this show this far and uh, you like the show, please go ahead and leave a review for us. And Josiah, I appreciate you so much coming on, man. I'm looking forward to talking to you more in the, in the coming weeks. 
Yeah, I just got to say, because I got to say it before the show, before we were live, but uh, you and Jeff, um, what you guys are doing is just awesome and, and so appreciate you. Um, I think you got an awesome podcast happening. Everything else you're doing and just who you guys are, it's genuine and that's just so tangible through through everything. And so I'm honored, I'm humbled to be on here with you and uh, look forward to to getting to work with you guys for a long time. I made my day, man. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. You gave me goosebumps. <laughs> I meant every word, man. I'm excited. You Thank guys you, brother. Are crushing it. Cool, so, man. Well, I'll, I'm sure I'll, I'll probably end up talking to you next week then. So we'll talk great. soon. Okay. Thanks, sounds dude. Great. Bye. Goodbye. All right, guys. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of the Chasing Freedom Podcast with Noah and Jeff. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel in the show notes below. And if you ever want to get a hold of us, feel free to do it via our Instagrams. You can also follow us for our funny content on TikTok.